just before this session we had a session on sthapatya kala and now we are going to be looking at chitra kala uh, before we move ahead to the session i would take this opportunity and the privilege to introduce nandita ji dr nandita krishna ji is a historian environmentalist and writer based in chennai nandita ji has a phd in ancient indian culture from bombay university where she specialized in indian art and religion and was also a heres scholar she has been a professor and research guide for the phd program of cpr institute of indological research affiliated to the university of madras she established the cp art center and shakuntala art center in chennai and the shakuntala jagannathan museum of folk art in kanchipuram apart from several educational institutions and is currently president of the cp ramasamy ayer foundation and director of cpr institute of indological research in chennai she was responsible for the revival of the painting traditions of the kurumba tribes pottery traditions of kota women and traditional drawing and painting in mamalapuram and for the introduction of tamil folk art forms in schools dr nandita krishna ji restored the vara varahishwara temple in damal and a 450 year old building in kanchipuram in 1990 she was deputed to the archaeological survey of india's restoration of angkor wat in cambodia and has researched the khmer temples and reported on the restoration process she has also been documenting india's ecological heritage traditions dr nandita krishna is the author of 23 books on indian art culture religion and the environment including life lessons from mahavira life lessons from adi shankara the book of avatars and divinities and several others it is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be here listening to you ma'am we are very very grateful to have you here with us i hand over the session to you now thank you so much thank you very much firstly i would like to thank you all for inviting me to speak today and to share what little knowledge i have about this great tradition we have of painting of art uh, actually the lecture i'm going to give you should have been three lectures because our heritage is so great you know i should have spoken separately on murals separately on miniatures separately on folk art but i am combining them all you will think that i am rushing through some of it and uh, i may not do justice to what you think i should do but i am trying to fit it into the limited time that i have because it is a very great heritage that we have and i would recommend to everybody please please go and see the art heritage there is something near every part of india so please go and see it visit it because that is where our culture remains mm -hmm. i have to share mm -hmm. share sorry i am uh, getting the uh, technical help huh what do i think no no it is good so today i'm going to speak about chitra kala and uh, which is primarily painting Indian painting is an aesthetic continuum that extends from the earliest civilizations of the subcontinent to the present day from being societal in the beginning to essentially religious later Indian painting has evolved over the years to become a fusion of various cultures and tradition in fact Indian painting reflects the oneness of the subcontinent uh, the paintings of ajanta for example when we go to that portion you will see are reflected as far north as 
Afghanistan and as far south as all the states of southern India. Indian art reflects the religious aspirations of their people, their lives, their joys and achievements. Unlike sculpture, where the figures are generally not supposed to be very emotional and are supposed to be an example of perfect living, paintings are imbued with emotion and expression. Painting is also a documentation of the life and times through the ages of kings, <clears throat> corpse, nature, plants, and animals. And you will see that many of our traditions we know only because we have them recorded in paintings, many of our animals and so on. Painting is a celebration of color, of festivals, and all that is beautiful. It's a record of happy people in happy days for whom art is a form of communication and expression. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, there are three types, murals, miniatures, and folk art. Hmm? Okay. The word mural, you heard it used often, is derived from the Latin word murus, which means wall. It can be applied to any artwork painted directly onto a wall, a ceiling, or other larger permanent surface. In fact, even our political uh, paintings on the walls of our streets are also murals. Now, within mural, there are two types, fresco painting, where water-based pigments are applied on freshly applied plaster on wall surfaces. The colors are made by grinding dry powder pigments in pure water, and they dry and set along with the plaster to become a permanent part of the wall. Now, in India, the plaster used was chugam, which is uh, something that can be polished and decorated with paintings. The other form of mural, murals is fresco seco. It's a technique by which pigments are mixed with lime and applied onto a dry plaster. I'm starting with Bhimbetka, which was declared a World Heritage Site. Now, all over India, we have rock paintings. And if I start uh, going into that, that will be a separate lecture. So I'm only going to talk about Bhim Vetka, which are the earliest records of human life on the Indian subcontinent. Many of the shelters over there, because they're in, in the form of caves, were inhabited by Homo erectus more than 100,000 years ago. And the paintings range from over 10,000 years ago to the medieval period. The most common subjects in the painting are wild animals, including the lion and tiger, apart from scenes of dancing and hunting. <coughs> and I must tell you something very interesting. It's a slight deviation. I had read the Ramayana, and there Bharadwaja tells Rama, Lakshmana, and Sita, as they are about to enter Nandakarani. He says, be careful. There are lions and tigers in the forest. Now, I know today that not just today, for a long time, there have been no lions in Nandakarani. Tigers, yes. So I said, OK, maybe this is just uh, Valmiki's imagination. Till I went to Bhimbeka. And there, on a 10,000-year-old painting, I saw the lion and the tiger together. You can't mistake these two animals because the lion has his big uh, the hair around his face and the tiger has stripes. So I saw it and then I realized, my goodness, all that we talk about as mythology is there. We only have to look for it. The rock paintings display the early concerns of man, food, survival in a hostile environment, and hunting animals that were stronger more powerful and as intelligent. Remember that Homo erectus was not the most intelligent um, creation. He just had certain skills. He could stand on two legs and he had hands. 
artists in Bhim Vedka used white and red colors of different shades. Occasionally, they used green, yellow, and orange. And these colors were prepared by combining manganese, hematite, wooden coal, soft red stone, and leaves. So we are talking about 10,000 years ago. Look at the knowledge that our people had at that time. Now I'm just classifying the paintings. Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Chalcolithic, Early Historic, and Medieval. And what is very interesting is, the later you go, there is a degeneration and crudeness of style. The earlier ones are beautiful. Upper Paleolithic, they are huge green, dark red figures of animals such as bison, tigers, lions, deers, and rhinoceros. Whereas the medieval paintings are not very, um, have nothing much to recommend. This is the famous zoo rock, just full of animals, elephants, sambar, bison, deer, peacock, snake, and many more. Hunting scenes depict hunters carrying bows and arrows, swords and sheaths. By the early medieval period, we also see men on horses. So here you can see a beautiful picture, oops, beautiful painting of a bison and all the people watching it. I don't know what they are doing. Here is another one, a lot of animals. You know, there are scenes even of worship. I saw there is one painting of which I couldn't reproduce it because it's not that clear, doesn't, uh, hasn't been photographed so brightly, but it's of men worshipping people, worshipping a tree. So that is how ancient these traditions, we still go around the people tree and they did it at that time also. Now I could go on about all the rock art of India, but that is a completely different subject and that will take the whole of my lecture. So I'm going further on to the classical period. Now the classical period really begins with the Ramayana and Mahabharata. And most art of, class, of the classical period is exquisite and generally religious. The Ramayana and Mahabharata mention the Chitra Shandas or art campaigns. Indra Prasad, the Pandava city, was a beautiful creation of art and color. And Mahabharat mentions that Otta Vyasa himself had mastered painting and could create, create the illusion of height and depth on the floor surface, recreating a non-existent reality. The Ramayana describes the floral designs and birds and animals on the Pushpaka Vimana of Ravana. Kalidasa describes the Bhakti Chedas or decorative patterns painted on elephant trunks. In India, the artists were greatly valued. The sculptor and painter were employed by the king for their proficiency. The artist had to be architect, engineer, sculptor, painter, metal craftsman, ivory carver, and even a scribe. So the stapati, you had the earlier lecture on the stapatiya tradition, the Stapati was well educated in Sanskrit and the local language. The artists had to master problems like depth, foreshortening, and so on. Interestingly, many kings in India were also artists. Mahendra Varman Pallava was known as Chitrakara Puli, a tiger among artists. Akbar was taught to draw and paint, and Jahangir was a very famed naturalist who had every kind of animal and bird painted, which has been a great help to us to know what was on the Indian subcontinent. And the models included royalty, devdasis, members of the court. The Vidushaka in the Vidhishala Bhajika recognizes the members of the Queen's retinue painted on the palace walls. Patsyayana enumerates the Sharanga, or the six 
talents of painting. Mukha Bheda, knowledge of appearance, Brahmanam, correct perception, measure and skull, and structure, Bhava, emotion, conveying feelings and forms, Lavanya Yojan, infusion of grace in artistic representation, Sadrishi, similarities, and Varnika Bhanga, artistic manner of using the brush and cut. The Shilpa Shastra deals with mural and miniature painting. Wood and cloth, often accompanied by text, were used as painting surfaces. And that is where our miniatures come from. But the most comprehensive text is the Vishnu Dharmutara Purana, which deals with the interdependence of dance, music, and the visual arts. And Interestingly, it says that unless you know everything, you cannot be an artist. You cannot just paint if you do not know dance and music. And in the Vishnu Dharmottara Purana, we have the Chitra Sutra, which describes the methods and ideals of painting, dealing not only with its religious aspects, but also proclaiming the joy that colors and forms and the representation of things that are seen and imagined can produce. The Chitra Sutra glorifies the painter's ability to draw a continuous free line with depth created primarily by dots. Now, what were the tools and materials they used? You had the Samudka Ka, a box of brushes, a board and easel, the Vartika, or wooden stumps for sketching, Kitalekini was made of root mixed with boiled rice and ro rolled into a pointed stump. Tulika was made of a thin bamboo rod with a copper pin and a small feather and was used for particularly for very um, delicate work and such as the eyes. And when the Nayana Umilana, that is the opening the eyes of the figure, was done, it was done with a tunika. Colors were applied with the lakini, made of the soft hair from the ear of a calf, with fixed lack, fixed with lac and varying thickness. Hair from the squirrel's tail was also used for brushes, and it's still used even today. Colors of veg were made of vegetable or mineral origin. And the binding material that's very important for murals because after all, they were painting on stone, and it's all very well to say I'm putting uh, chunam over it, but how do you buy the two? So they used vajralepa, which is an animal medium. But a lot of the Jains and uh, Jains did not want to use an animal medium, so they used the nir nirja sakala, which is a vegetable medium. Now I'm going to talk about the beginnings of classical painting, which we have, which we can see. The story of Indian mural painting starts in the second century BC at Ajanta. The Ajanta caves consist of 30 rock-cut Buddhist Chaityas and Viharas, which date from the second century BC to the seventh century, with depictions of the Buddha and the Jataka tales. The caves were built in two phases. The first starting around the 2nd century BC and the second between the 5th and 7th centuries CE. Ajanta was a center of learning, with provision for teaching and accommodation of the Viharas where the monks lived. The caves are situated in a horseshoe plan, as you can see over here, connected by a common exterior pathway. Ninnaga, the celebrated Buddhist philosopher and author of books on logic, lived here in the 5th century according to Zhuang Zhang, whom we in India call Yuin Zhang. My pronunciation of both words is bad. He was a great Chinese scholar who visited India in the 7th century. Unfortunately, the Ajanta, or maybe I should say fortunately, the caves were abandoned and forgotten until it was accidentally rediscovered in 1819 by a British officer, 
John Smith, who was on a tiger hunt. He fell back and he saw this big hall full of paintings. In recent times, the paintings were so bright. I have seen them um, 50 years ago or maybe more when they were bright and I could see so much more. And I have seen them again about 10 years ago when they have faded because of human visits and the use of powerful um, lights and also the camera you know, photography with artificial lighting. They are a well heritage site. Now the first period is the, is the Shatavahana period and it was probably built under the, under the patronage of the Shatavahanas who ruled the region. Caves 9 and 10 are Chaitya halls containing stupas and fragments of murals indicating that the artist had mastered the technicalities of the jod in his depiction of court life, while caves 12, 13 and 15 are Vihara. By the Shatvahana period, if not earlier, Indian painters had mastered the technique of the fluid line and developed a naturalistic style in the depiction of last large groups of people, not unlike the reliefs of the Toranas across bars on the gates of Sanchi. So this is a Shatvahana painting. And when, you, when I show you the later period, the Vakataka, you will see that it is very different. The second Novakataka period began in the 5th century. Now this is the Gupta period. It's also called the Mahayana phase of the Chandra. Some 20 cave built temples were built as Viharas with the sanctum at the back. And the caves of this period, uh, maybe earlier caves also extended or remodeled. Some are Chaitya halls, while the rest are Viharas. In the case of this Pakataka period, the majority of the images represent the Buddha alone or scenes of his former lives. Four of the later caves have large and well preserved mural paintings, which have come to represent Indian mural painting itself. They also represent the glories of the Gupta classical period of India. <clears throat> there are two stylistic groups, the earlier in caves 16 and 17 and later in caves 1 and 2. And paintings in cave 1 depict the Jataka tales of the previous lives of the Buddha as a king and with the Buddha about to renounce royal life. This is the Mahajanaka Jataka. It is so beautiful. Look at, look at the picture. The king is not his in deep meditation, concentration. He's not at all affected by all the women over there. And yet this is a scene of court life. He's going to get up and renounce the world. This is most probably the most famous image of Ajanta, Bodhisattva Padmapadma. Padmapani means holding a Padma in his hand. And look at the fluid lines, look at the eyebrow. It's like a bow. It's, that is how it is described in the Chitra Sutra, that the eyebrows must be like the bow of a the weapon, the bow, weapon, the bow. And the eyes, all the eyes in Ajanta are half closed. And the suggestion of depth comes from a kind of dots. You can't even see them as dots. But they're very tiny dots which are given to give this feeling of depth. Look at, look at this. At this period, you have, you have this beautiful classical image and with a three-dimensional figure. This is Bodhisattva Vajrapani, holding the Vajra, but that part of his hand is missing. And he's I've got this elaborate headdress. If you can see the detail, it is very, 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 very elaborate. This is the cave where you have the Buddha 
at the back and you have the entire paintings on the walls. So this is how the Ajanta Caves were built. The Ajanta fresco, the Ajanta painting style was fresco seco, or painted on a dry plaster surface. And the paintings consist of large scenes spreading in all directions from a single figure, which is the Buddha. And the paintings were obviously the work of painters familiar with court life. So we saw earlier that they knew so much about court life. So they were obviously the king's painters. And some paintings depict show previous lives of the Buddha as a king and the sensuous and material lives of the court. The frescoes are rich, celebrating physical beauty. And interestingly, early Western observers felt they were shockingly out of place in caves presumed to be meant for religious worship and ascetic monastic life. But why did they do that? Why did they have these beautiful women sort of in a cave where, which was for monks? The idea was probably that they should learn to give up this life, to learn to lead a monastic life for which they had to give up the pleasures of a sensuous life. We have scenes from shops, festivals, jesters, palaces, foreigners and foreign trade. We have lapis lazuli, which obviously came from Afghanistan and wine, which would have come from Rome. The eyes are large, half closed. We saw it earlier, half closed with protruding, thick protruding lips. Skin colors are generally brown. Exquisite line work was done by the artist. Depth and contours are provided through minute dots and color variations, like shading. Emotionally charged scenes of the Buddha of Bodhisattva, through which only the Buddha or the Bodhisattva remains calm and unaffected. See, even here, he is very calm, whereas all of them are full of emotion. I want to show you this. She is known as Darpana Sundari. I don't know who gave her the name. What is fascinating is that this is a pitch dark cave. And if you just shine a light at this woman, you find a shiny white necklace. It looks like a diamond or pearl necklace, which she's wearing, which means that they knew the use of luminous paint. Ajanta is one, uh, the style of Ajanta has lived right through Indian art. Soon after, you find paintings, similar paintings at Bagh Caves, 150 kilometers north of Ajanta, which depict some aspects of Buddhist life and scenes from ordinary life. It goes as far as Central Asia, where Kushana painting, you see the same line work, and you see the half closed eyes and the depth created by the dots. Not very successfully, but still, the artist has made an effort. This is Sigiriya in Sri Lanka, where again you have the same Ajanta style with the half opened eyes and so on. Interestingly, you find it in Mugao, in Danhuang, in China. And I went there and I saw the, all the paintings there. And there too, you have. The same half closed eyes, you have the same Ajanta style. Look at the headdress, and in the middle of all this, the Buddha, untouched and unaffected. In fact, in Mukao, in the paintings, there's so much emotion because Chinese painters did paint a lot of emotion. But only the Buddha remains untouched by all the emotion. These are paintings which you can no longer see. But since I had them, I thought I would show them to you. The Chalukya paintings of Badami, which have disappeared. 
they have just gone because of the poor maintenance of the place. The beautiful faces of the king and the queen are reminiscent of Ajata, again the half-closed eyes, the thick lips, the contours of different parts of the face creating protruding structures of the face. So although it's a flat background, each face looks as if it is in three dimension. Thus with simple line treatment, artists could create volume. Then we come to the Pallava period, where again you have the effect of Ajanta. This is in the Talagandishwara temple at Panamalai in Virupur. It is a small shrine and it has only one mural painting left. An exquisite female figure, probably Parvati or a queen, under an umbrella and her leg is bent. She's standing against a wall with this umbrella above and look at her face. The same techniques, the protruding lips, the half-closed eyes, the bow. And by now, by the 7th, 8th century, all the canons, the shastras, were starting to be put down. So after this, it is not just that it was an Ajanta style, but they, it was a very definite attempt to do this kind of painting. There are also paintings in the Kailasnatha temple. There are 50 cells and painting is left over in some of them, but here too, a lot of it has disappeared. In Elora, you have the Rashtrakuta paintings, ceiling detail. This is Jain King of Indra Saka. This is 8th century, 9th century, late, much later than Pallava. And, but you can still see the influence of Ajanta. So you can imagine what a fantastic school of painting Ajanta was if its effects, if its influence could cover centuries, not just a few days. In the 8th century, you still have this effect in Sittanavasa, the Pandya paintings, these are Jaina paintings. And you have Jain Teeth Tankaras, and there's this beautiful lotus pond with a whole lot of apsaras and all trying to pick up the flowers. Now, over here, we found that the plants around it were not growing. Then, when we tried to find out why, we found that because that they were the Jains, they were Jains and they didn't use animal fat. They, were, they had planted the Indian squir squill. It's a kind of onion, okay? Not something you can eat, but it's a root vegetable. And they made use that as a kind of a uh, paste to make it hold on to the plaster. So here was a local innovation to prevent the use of animal fat. Finally, we come to the Chola paintings of Tanjau. Each fresco is about three and a half, uh, four and a half by three meters tall and wide, and depicts various forms of Shiva. I, I, this painting, we are talking about abstract painting today. Look at this painting. This is a dancer swirling. Her back is to us, her front face is to us, so is, is it back or far front? This is abstraction, long before Picasso discovered it. Look at these also of Chola painting. This is Rajaraja Chola with his guru, Karur Teva. Now the eyes are a little more open and a little more bright. But look at this, an angry Shiva, Tripurantaka, going to destroy the demon Tripurantaka. In fact, the Chola paintings are exquisite. They have scenes of cooking in the kitchen, the pots and pans they used. They have scenes of dancers, so on. I wish I had the time to show you all the Chola paintings. Now we come to Vijayanagara. 
which is yet another period after the Chola period. Uh, best example of Vijayanagar painting is in Lepakshi, near Hindu Pur in Andhra Pradesh. There are other places also, Purukarakundra near Trichy, which is the early phase, Veerabhadra temple at Lepakshi, uh, which where this wall, ceiling, everything is covered. This is a scene of a boar hunt, where I think the boar is attacking the hunters. The Virupaksha temple has paintings of the ceiling of the Mantapa, narrating the events, the history of the Dari dynasty, events from the Ramayana and Mahabharata, and important panels like the Dhyaranya, the great Shankaracharya of uh, Shungeri, who was the spiritual teacher of Bukharaya, he carried in a palanquin in procession and incarnations of Vishnu. In the Pakshi, all the walls of the Shiva temple are covered with a profusion of these paintings. The Vijayanagar period, faces are shown in profile. Please note, they're all generally in profile with large frontal lines. They have narrow waists, exaggerated narrow waists. And the three-dimension effect of the earlier paintings has now become two-dimensional. The lines are fluid, the compositions are in rectilinear compartments. So you have one story and another story, one after another. And these conventions were adopted by artists of later South Indian dynasty, like the Nayaka paintings. This is the Virupaksha temple ceiling. It's a beautiful painting, but you can see they're all in little boxes. This is the, these are the paintings of the Vardaraja Padmal temple. What is left of those paintings? We published a book on it and uh, that is one book left. I mean, what is even in this book is no longer to be seen in the temple. It's very, very sad that we are not maintaining, we are not restoring. Look at other countries. They have far less than us. We maintain it and restore it, we don't. This is a beautiful scene from the Vardaraja Parmal Temple. But you can see what, how it is. And if you go near, you'll see names. So and so came here and rubbish like that. This is a Nayaka painting. It generally depicts scenes from the Mahabharata and Ramayana and the Krishna Lila. You have them in Tiruparan Kundram, Sri Rangam, Tiruvadu, and uh, Chidambaram. This is from Chidambaram, where you have panels of paintings, narrated stories, narrating stories related to Shiva and Vishnu. <coughs> in Tiruvalanjuli, you have a Nataraja. The Sri Krishna temple at Chengam in Arcot district has 60 panels narrating the Ramayana and which was a late phase of the Nayaka painting. Nayaka painting is really an extension of the Vijayanagar style with regional modifications. And uh, the figures are still slim wasted, but not so slim any longer. The artist has tried to bring in movement to make the paintings more dynamic. These are the Maratha paintings of the Bradishwara temple in Tanjaun, which are mural paintings. Then we come to the Kerala murals, which take place between the 16th and the 18th century. This is in the Dutch palace at Matanjeri in the Padmanabhapura Palace at Trivandra. It's a unique pictorial language which has certain stylistic elements of the Nayaka and Vijayanagar schools, but they develop this, they develop their figures using contemporary dance traditions like Kathakali and Kalamariti, which is the ritual folklore painting. So you will find that there is a lot of uh, appearance of Kathakali in these paintings. 
They are based on episodes from the Ramayana and Mahabharata. And uh, 60 sites, of the 60 sites, there are three palaces. The Dutch Palace of Matan Cheri, and the Padmanabhapuram Palace, and the Krishnapuram Palace in Kayalpur. This is the mature phase of Kerala's mural painting tradition. But our mural tradition goes on, and those of you who have visited Sheikh Havati in Rajasthan must have seen these beautiful paintings. The region was ruled by descendants of the 15th century Rajput Rao Sheka, and the paintings decorate the interior and the exterior, exterior walls of the Havelis. Thick layers of pigment are applied and worked on to a wet plaster surface, incised with geometric and floral designs. So, like all other paintings, these were mineral or vegetable colors. Pictures were drawn and colored individually on the dry plaster surface. Lines were in charcoal and red ochre. First, the outlines of groups of figures were drawn, corrected, and reached their final form when the artist painted them in color by color. So, but these were not always religious. Some places are religious, like you can see here, but there are a lot of uh, uh, folk tales, historical events, daily life, and so on. Unfortunately, when the Marwadis moved out of Shekhar, the school, school started declining. And uh, today, we can only see what is left of the Shekhari um, Havelis. Mural paintings continue to adorn the exterior and interior walls of houses everywhere in the country. They're usually made by women at the time of ceremonies or as a routine to clean and decorate the walls. Some of the other traditional forms of murals are the Pitoro, Pitoro parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat, Mithila painting in Bihar, Varli in Maharashtra, and the paintings on the walls in villages of Odisha, Bengal, Madhya Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh. That Orissa is fabulous. The street walls are filled with exquisite paintings. And what paintings we buy on paper these days were once done on the mud walls of houses. Now we come to miniature paintings. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to rush through. Um, the, in spite of the more social importance of mural painting, art galleries of Chitrasha or Chitrashalas existed for a restricted audience. And there are several references, as I said, by Kalidasa and Shakuntalam Dandin and Ashokumara Charita. And the Shilpa Shastra deals with it in great um, detail. The art reached its zenith during the Mughal period when several styles came together, Indian, Rajasthani, Persian, Central Asian, and even European. The different schools of Rajasthani painting come under this genre, and the Ragmala paintings also belong to the school. The company paintings produced during the British Raj were very different but they come under miniature painting. And Tandor and Mysore paintings are also classified. Miniature painting does not have to be very small. It's something that you take out, you hang on your wall, and, uh, and you don't paint on the wall itself. The earliest extant miniatures are found in the manuscript Ashtasahas. Pika Pragnya Paramita, which belongs to the period of Mahipala. And uh, unfortunately, this style disappeared by the 12th century. It's got beautiful lines and subdued tones of color. These Pala paintings, miniature paintings, are very beautiful. And the reason why many of the miniature paintings have not survived early paintings is because they were done on palm leaves. Like in Western India, Vaishnava and Jain manuscripts contain these paintings. And if you're very keen on seeing 
manu uh, manuscript painting, um, miniature painting on palm leaf manuscripts. Two places, one is Gujarat, Ahmedabad. The other is the Saraswati Mahal Library in Tanjore, which has a beautiful connect, uh, connection. The Jain painters prefer three quarter profiles, and one of the eyes was always displaced. So, this is something unique. And the Jain paintings gave rise to the Gujarat school and spread to Rajasthan and Malpa. Then we come to the Mughal miniatures which were the miniature painting was actually set up in Humayun's time, reached its zenith in Jahangir's. They were very small, not more than a few. They were really miniatures, brightly colored and highly detailed, mostly used to illustrate manuscripts and books, like um, the, Akbar had a lot of books translated and Ramayana and all were reproduced in both Persian and painting. They are incredibly precise with lines painted using brushes composed of a single hair. They are a bed blend of the bold, vivid colors of India, the delicate lines of Persian painters, European influence which came to India from the Jesuit missionaries. So it drew from all these. And unlike Hindu Jain and Buddhist manuscripts, were generally religious, Mughals commissioned portraits of themselves, also animals and plants. Naturalism in nature became very fundamental in the school. Landscape details were inspired by Far Eastern art, clouds from Chinese painting, mountains and water by, from Central Asian art, Persian tradition of stressing linearity of lines and so on. Now, I'm not going to read out all this, just to give you Example, the earliest Mughal miniatures are in the Mayan period, and he brought back to India two Persian artists. He commissioned the text of the Khamsa of Nizami, and this is where you all these, this whole Mughal style really developed. But you can see that there is absolutely no three dimensional effect. You have the Mayan face in front, the leg is not turn this way, it's turned to a side. So it is very two-dimensional effect. This is Akbar, and it is believed that he himself could paint, which we really don't know. He had Tuti Nama, Hamza Nama, Gulistan, Rama and Mahabharata, and all painted. And during this period, it was realism and naturalism. So here you have the birth of Salim. You can make out the Rajput princess. She is slightly different in color. And baby Salim, who's going to be Jahangir, she is he's here. And all the rest are Central Asian. This is his mother um, attending the birth. This is the assembly of faith. As you know, Akbar was very interested in religion. This is the Hamza Nama, the story of the uncle of the prophet. Jahangir was very influenced and inspired by European painting. And he was sent gifts of oil paintings, including portraits of the king and queen of India. And he encouraged his artists to take up the single point perspective. And he particularly encouraged paintings of course his life, but studies of birds, flowers, and animals. He was an avid hunter, but he was also a student of natural history. And in his time, he wrote, had the Jahangir Nama written. Look at this. This is the only way we know that the dodo existed. This is the only uh, actual representation we have of the dodo. All this was from Jahangir's period. Of course, the hunting scenes, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, pretty awful. Some are very bloody with animals being killed in large numbers. This is Shah Jahan, who preferred architecture, as we all know. But his style was very stiff, formal. Always, they were all in uh, 
profile, all the faces. And even here, the emphasis was more on the architecture. Aurangazeb saw a rejection of painting, and yet some of the best local paintings were made for him. He, uh, at the beginning, he permitted it, and later he stopped. So this is the newly crowned emperor of Aurangzeb in his golden throne, with a falcon in his hand. So this was the swan song of Mughal miniatures in the Deccan period. Hindola Ranka and one of the uh, sultans of the Bahmani uh, sultanates. They were all mostly Shia sultanates and their paint, paintings here are based more on local tradition. Ragmala paintings illustrating the moods of Nagas were an innovation of the Deccan style. Most people think of it as Rajasthani, yes, but it was it began in Deccani painting with, by several artists and were made for Hindu patrons in the Deccan. This is the finale of the Mughal school. It's to be seen in this Deccani style, which is rigid, stylized, and decorated. Then we come to the Rajput school, which was spontaneous and folksy in opposition to the heraldic court style of the Mughal school was derived from the Gujarat school of painting. So um, Rajput paintings depicted scenes of everyday life, festivals, subjects from the epics and Puranas, and important episodes from the life of Lord Krishna, because it coincided with the spread of the Krishna cult as a part of the Bhakti movement in medieval North India. Colors were extracted from minerals, plants, conch shells and even precious stones. This is a painting of the Mewar school. It's, it, of all the schools, this is the most important because it has warm colors, simplicity and freshness. This is the famous Godhuli, that is the time when the cows go home. And here you have Krishna and his friends chasing the cows home. The Mewar school includes several others like Chavar, Nathwara, Devgad, Udaipur, and Savar. So here are some. This is Nathwara. This is Chavar. Savar. Sorry, my dog has come in and is growling. He wants attention. Um, Udaipur and so on. Now this is Ragmala of the Mewar school. And you can see that the Deccani tradition has taken a different style over here, where the entire, um, where all of nature is affected by the Raga. The Marwar school includes Kishingar, Jodhpur, Bikaner, Pali. Pali, look at this. Now you know why we don't have tigers in India. Kishingar, Thane Rao, Bikaner, Marwar, Jodhpur, Bundelkhand, Mundi. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through it. There's no other way I could cover such a vast subject. And the themes in these paintings are Krishna Leela, the epics, Ragmalas, Rasamanjari, royalty and court life, wars, hunting, Zera, Zenana women, and the Bara Masa. That is something unique, the 12 months in the year. A related school is the Pahari school, which was situated at Bashoni, Jammu, Buler, and Kanda. It was lively, romantic, and highly evocative, unlike the more folksy Rajasthani schools. The drawings are very refined and very superior to all other schools of Indian miniature painting, particularly Kamala. Themes were primarily Shringara, social themes, the love story of Radha and Krishna, based on the Bhagavad Puran and the Gita. 
And what is beautiful about the Pahari school is the lush woodlands and the several shades of green that they use. This is a scene of Holi, Kashori, Jammu, and Kashmir style. Look at the many colors of the trees in the back. Here again. Look at this. It's so beautiful. Radha Krishna. Kangra also depicts life from the life of Krishna and they are extremely beautiful. I'm not going to read out all that. Here's Krishna with the gopis and the cows. And this is a scene of Rama, Lakshmina and Sita in the forest. Just look at the absolute beauty of this. This is the Kangra style of Himachal Pradesh. So I think these are probably the culmination of the miniature school. When we come back to the South Tanjavur painting, which was which came from the Vijayanagar school, when Vijayanagar was when the Vijayanagar Empire fell after the Battle of Talikota, the artists migrated to Mysore and Tanjavur. In the Tanjavur school, you have this effect, gesso effect on wood. They were painted on wood and canvas and they used gum Arabic to give a relief effect. The main figure is always very large. I mean, look at Krishna, he's a baby, but he's so much larger. And the uh, Radha, the woman standing here, the peacock, it could be Radha or Anda, is so much smaller than Krishna. Now, this is a glass painting of Krishna. And interestingly, this was done by the school of uh, an atelier of a Chinese artist who lived, about 40 artists lived in the port of Sarfoji. And they did these paintings in the technique of Chinese reverse class painters. So actually, it's very difficult because you start with the eyes, eyebrows, everything. Finally, you finish the background. So you get a very flat image. And their idea of Indian is also quite this thing. They just had these round faces. And the only way to make them different and thin lips, everything. And they made them different by giving them the guys. My saw painting also evolved from Vijayanagar paintings and was uh, developed was encouraged by Krishna Rajavadya. And he himself wrote the Sri Tatra Nidhi with a compendium of illustrations. What is interesting in both Tanjaur and Mysore, the kings were very, very involved with the paintings. And both uh, Sarfoji and Krishna Rajavadya did a lot of work to encourage the school. Like Tanjavur, Mysore paintings are also done on wood and cloth, but they do not have such a pronounced relief effect. It's just a long side. Both use gold leaf, both Tanjavur and Mysore painting, but the Mysore paintings are far more, are far flatter and two dimensional. I'm going to end with folk art. Now, you all see your mother, your sister, your wife doing a column or rangoli or alpana outside the house. I'm sure most of you do not think it was art, think it is art, but it is. Even that is an expression and that is really art because these women are not taught, they are untaught, they just do it on their own. So that is folk art. I'm going, just going to run through the schools. Madhubani painting, it originated in Mithila and it was done on freshly plastered mud walls. And it, it was made from powdered rice paste. It's, it generally depicts people, nature, and scenes, and deities from the epics. And uh, you have scenes of Krishna and Radha people all around. This is a very interesting painting. 
And in Madhubani painting, no space is left empty. All the gaps are filled by flowers, animals, even little geometric designs, like whatever these are supposed to be, stars or something. So this is Madhubani. And interestingly, Madhubani is really the Indian style side of what we call Mithila painting. Now, Mithila comes from the ancient town of Mithila, and it is believed, according to the Ramayana, that uh, Sita's mother, Sunayana, she was a painter, and she taught the women painting. So, Madhubani and Mithila are really the same. And if you see Mithila painting, you'll find them just like Madhubani. And I like to think that this is a school that came from the time of Sita, goddess Sita herself. Hard painting of Rajasthan is a style of scroll painting narrating the stories of Pabuji and Dev Narayan, four deities of Rajasthan. Each card is about 15 feet, and those of Dev Narayan are 30 feet long. And priest singers called Bhopas carry down the paintings narrating their stories of battle, adventure, and love, while Rajput royalty and so on. And the Joshi families of Bilwara and Shapura, the traditional artists. This is a kind of pre-television form of art when these scrolls were used when there was no television which people could see. So the story starts over here with the Ganesh Puja, and here you have the Dashavatara, and it goes on. Warli paintings of Maharashtra are tribal paintings. They're painted on white or mud walls and resemble prehistoric cave paintings. They have scenes of human figures, and generally it's hunting, dancing, and it's all done generally in circles. The circle depicts the sun and the moon, and the triangle represents mountains. And the square is a sacred enclosure on that. So you will find that Marley paintings generally have this kind of circle. Here's another circle. And then you have different shapes, squares, triangles, and so on. Bone. Bone are the original people of India, the tribes of Central India, who create beautiful depictions of animal creation myths, rituals, and festivals. They are created with dots and dashes, similar to the Aboriginal tribes of Australia. In fact, when I went to Australia, I was shocked because I thought these could be the gold paintings when I saw their Aboriginal paintings. Originally, the paintings were done on the walls of their homes, but now they do it on paper. And as you can see, they're all dots and dashes. All these are dots. When we come to the Patta Chitra of Orissa, which is a cloth-based scroll painting. Patta means cloth, Chitra means painting. And they were done by the Chitrakars of Lord Jagannath and Lord Krishna. And this tradition still survives in Puri, Raghurajpur, Paraleka, Mundi, and Sulu. Painting is extremely popular in Risa. In fact, a girl to get a good husband has to be a good artist to that extent. And it resembles the traditional murals of India temples. So here is a Patta Chitra. This is now, nowadays, what happens is because there are no longer any scroll painters. They do it on cloth and sell it. In Bengal, Patta Chitra is called Potta Chitra, Pot Chitra. And it's divided into Dilka Pot, Chal Chitra, Tribal Pot Chitra, Medinipur Pot Chitra, and Kali Ghat Pot Chitra. Chal Chitra refers to the baby Chal or Durga Chal, the background of the Durga Pratima. So the covering around the Devi ha has this potter chitra to give a proper proportion to the structure. There are also continuous stories used by wandering man minstrels. So you can see this is how it's been 
scrolled up and is the whole story over here. This is from the museum. This is how they do it. The women hold it up and narrate in each incident. And it's been used for a lot of social causes also. And this is the Durga pot. It gives a background to Durga during the Durga puja. Chiriyal in Andhra Pradesh also has a scroll painting tradition. And it is very beautiful, very vibrant. And like the Potter Chitra, it has these continuous images. With huge, the figures are very lively, big, big eyes and mouth and so on. Then we have Kalamkari, which is pen worked. It's concentrated in Andhra Pradesh, in Sri Kalahasti and Machili Patan, which requires a constant supply of clean, clean river water, which in uh, Kalahasti it gets from the river Swarnamukhi, which goes through. It was a rural occupation and is still passed from one generation to another. The cloth is stiffened using mordant and buffalo blue, dried in the sun, then sketch the design with black color, and the colors are still obtained only from natural plants, indigo, green, red, and yellow. Every painting, Kalankari painting from Kalahasti is unique. There's the Gita Pradesham, Krishna, Arjuna, and the horse drawn chariot. Which why means a handing, and they are hung on walls of temples and houses, especially in Nathwara, near Udaipur, where they originated. This is a painting of Nath himself, Krishna of Nathwara. Kali Ghat painting is famous in Calcutta. Near the Kali Ghat temple, the artist created designs on paper. And interestingly, the great artist Jamini Roy was influenced by Kali Ghat paintings. But they're quite funny also. Here's a woman beating up her husband. Here's the story of uh, Arjuna uh, Draupadi Swayamgara, Arjuna uh, trying to get the moving fish. And here's a barber cleaning a man's ear. So these are the kind of very amusing pictures you see in Kali Ghat paint. Then you have the Kuruma painting, which we discovered. The CP Ramaswamy Foundation discovered in the Nilgiris in a 3,000 year old rock site. And our artists work with the artists of uh, the Kurumbas we used to do these paintings on the walls of their homes. Now they've started doing it on paper. And what is very interesting is how they make the stick figures move and make them sit and stand and dance and do so many things. Finally, we come to the company style, company Kalam. Kalam and uh, it's a style blended with Rajput, Mughal, and Western art. And the leading centers were Calcutta, Madras, then Delhi, Lucknow, Patna, Bangalore, and Tanjavur. So it's very interesting because these are all very realistic paintings and they use Western watercolors to give us an idea of the India of that time. You see, all the paintings are not always realistic, whereas the company paintings are very realistic. And here you could see an East India Company official and his servants, a group of courtesans. There are many other tribal and rural communities who continue their, who continue their painting traditions. Much more documentation must be done. Indians love color. Painting gives expression to their emotions and love for colorful celebrations. Thank you very much for patiently listening to what I have to say. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Nandida Krishna ji. Uh, I must say that every painting that I got to saw created a sense of wonderment in me. 
such an inspiration and the genius of artists from our land simply unfathomable uh, thank you so much for exposing us in the traditions uh, so to say chitrakala i'm sorry i rushed through but there was no way i could i mean if there's so much more that i've left out i mean uh, that that in itself says is that how much more work needs to be done there and uh, this was very very valuable and precious for all of us with your permission could we take a couple of questions definitely okay uh, may i request uh, mansi ji to go ahead namaskar ma'am uh, ma'am i uh, have uh, i must say you are a reservoir of all those work that i have just seen i've never seen such beautiful pieces Uh, Ma'am, my very small question is: What has led to the disappearance of such beautiful pieces of work? It hasn't disappeared. I mean, it, it's already there. But one thing you told that it was the that they are not they were not maintained properly. When when this is such such a heritage to our country, so why why people do not work to you know you know to uh, reinvent them to re to bring them back to life? i think this is going to be a very important part of ips i think this is something which you young people should do my generation we documented and we are telling you that all this existed now you all have to bring it back to life you see we have not cared for our tradition we were busy selling the taj mahal and god knows what else but there is so much i mean if you go to ajanta and elora uh it's something amazing any place you any place you go to in india you say oh, this is the best and then the next place you go you say that is the best so it's just sad that uh, we had to wait for the british to come discover ajanta it's our fault we let our traditions go why i thought you know i got the, i got the answer from the Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, there is another question in the chat box. Uh, if I could read it to you, ma'am. Please. Yeah. What is the history of uh, carved uh, paintings? The one on small cupboards that open up. Uh, it is also on the decline. um what can or needs to be done in the education system to preserve these uh, painting traditions see painting responds to the market if i want a carved uh, painted cupboard and i give the order and i'm willing to pay for it they will do it the problem is that the you see two two groups since you specifically mention the carved painted cupboards let me tell you that there were two groups who did a lot of this one were the marwaris in rajasthan and the other were the chettiars again a business group in south india and i'm sure there were other business families too now they have changed their style uh, today we have become very westernized we want uh, westernized cupboards westernized furniture unless we go back and we do this again look at the shekhavati houses all the marwaris live in bombay and calcutta and everywhere else in those if you go to shekhavati you cry because they are all just falling down so that that is the problem and whereas the same people who own those houses have very modern luxurious houses with Uh, Italian floors and uh, Parisian uh, furniture. So we have to decide whether what is beautiful that we have the beauty in our own culture and bring it out. Very well said, ma'am. We have to. We have to patronize the arts. Art is not something that you know. Okay, there are today there are artists who just sit and paint. and people buy but this kind of artists you see these are all small people we have to patronize them if you're putting up a building have have a wall painted ask him to come and paint you will have local traditional folk artists 
ask them to come and paint that way. They'll do a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you so much for, the, for that answer, uh, ma'am. We have another question from Kayal Viriji. Uh, I request you to go ahead. Ma'am, the session was really wonderful and uh, we could go through the different arts. Now, how do we bring this into our education system so that even the young children learn all these kind of arts and it can be rejuvenated in our country back? In our schools, we teach our children traditional art forms. Because we are in the South, we teach them traditional South Indian art forms. So you can teach the children. The other thing is, of course, to have textbooks which talk about Indian art. When you talk about any period, you talk about so much we learn about the Rajputs, the texts we were fought with, why and all that. Why don't we also say that they produce these beautiful works of art. You can have one uh, chapter about it. That is what we are not doing. Yes. And we can, we are all the time, our history is all political. Who fought with who, who killed who, brother killed brother, brother killed father. It's kind mm -hmm. of nonsense. But the same period also brought out beautiful works of sculpture, of buildings, of paintings. Let's look at the positive instead of saying that everyone was killing everyone else. That's what I would say. Do we have some specific textbooks which gives a reference of the how the art can not be taken much. over teaching? Unfortunately, okay. not for children. Mm -hmm. um, there are beautiful books on Indian art, but not for children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Kairiji. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering the question. Is, are there any more questions? I would uh, request the participants to kindly raise hand. The chat box is also open. In case you would like to share your question on the chat box, you can go ahead. Yeah, so we have Dr. Suman Gupta ji. Please go ahead, ma'am. Ma'am, Namaskar. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Ma'am, what is the major difference between the mural and the miniature paintings? Mural is done on walls. And I told you right at the beginning, mural comes from mural comes from the word murus, which means wall. Even in French, wall is le mur. It is wall. Murals are done on straight on the walls, like Ajanta, Elora, Bhimbetka, and so on. Miniature paintings are done on paper or something else, or cloth or wood, something that you can take and give as a gift or hang it on your wall. But it's not done directly on the wall. Murals are wall paintings. That is the difference. Can't hear you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Muted. Tha. That is the uh, fresco painting. Present time, where is the fresco paintings uh, training or available? Um, I know the Mahabalipuram School of Art, uh, I think it's School of Sculpture and Painting. They are giving training. They train sculpture, traditional sculpture, traditional painting. And in fact, when we renovated our museum in Kanchipur. I brought an artist from Mahabalipuram School of Painting and they did all the traditional paintings which used to be there on the walls. They restored it. So it's done there. I'm sure there are other places. I know in the south, I think Kumbakonam has it also. But I'm sure it's there all over India. I don't know. I must be honest. Okay, okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, many tiny years काम किया है तो वहां पे मैंने वहां की दीवारों में देखा था फ्रेस्को प्रिंटिंग और वहां जापान से लोग बनस्ली यूनिवर्सिटी व्हिच यूनिवर्सिटी बनस्ली यूनिवर्सिटी राजस्थान जयपुर ओके वहां पे दीवारों में फ्रेस्को पेंटिंग है वहां पे दो हफ्ते दो महीने के लिए मुझे पता लगा था कि वहां मैंने 10 इयर्स काम किया मेरे सामने तो कोई नहीं आया बट वहां जापान से आते थे सिखाने के लिए बनस्ली यूनिवर्सिटी 
यूनिवर्सिटी में बट मैंने कभी देखा नहीं बट वहाँ दीवालों में है जयपुर में वुमेन यूनिवर्सिटी है बनस्ली यूनिवर्सिटी वहाँ की दीवालों में फ्रेस्को पेंटिंग कराई जाती है वहाँ के स्टूडेंट्स है ये बहुत जगह में अभी भी करते हैं लेकिन इतना नहीं करते हैं जितना पहले कर रहे थे और दूसरी बात है कि दे डोंट नाउ दिस द फैशन इज फॉर वेस्टर्न यू नो रियलिज्म एब्स्ट्रैक्ट दे हैज टू बी अ मार्केट फॉर इट दैट्स व्हाई से स्पॉन्सर्स की जरूरत है बहुत ज्यादा और बहुत मेहनत भी लगती है बहुत सी पेंटिंग में उनके लिए वॉल को बहुत तैयार करना पड़ता है तो दैट इज द हार्ड वर्क वेरी थैंक यू सो मच आई थिंक देर आर वी डोंट हैव एनी मोर क्वेश्चन वी आर वेरी वेरी ग्रेटफुल नंदिता जी फॉर हैविंग यू हियर एंड थैंक यू सो मच फॉर टेकिंग इट वॉज सच एन ऑनर to listen to listen to you thank you so much dhanyawad